on this book tour, I've been in, oh, just about every city you can name, and um, every one of them is excited about local food. This is a national movement that is exploding. Its time has come, and I can't believe we released this book into a, a tidal wave of interest. It was, I, I promise, it was a complete accident that we are trendy. Um, <laughs> To me before <laughs> when we uh, when we first imagined this project and this book we thought that, you know there was no name for what we were doing there the name for it was what are you crazy um, <laughs> but that has changed and and it's an exciting change I'm gonna read to you um, a, we're gonna do a brief program today so that we have <coughs> time for questions and answers um, because I know you all have to get back to work, right? Um, back to the farms. Back, back to your farms, right. Back to, back to weeding and composting. Um, this book is co-authored with my husband, Stephen Hawk, and our oldest daughter, Camille Kingsolver. Stephen and Camille both contributed brief chapters, brief essays that sort of sprinkle through the book, and they left it to me to make it a good story. Because uh, that seems to be the only thing I know how to do. Um, so this, I'm going to read to you just some uh, brief pieces of the book, and we'll have some. Uh, it'll be interwoven with some images of the farm that tell more of the story. Photographs taken by Stephen, and then we'll have plenty of time afterward for conversation on this subject. Can everybody hear okay? Yes. I know you probably can't all see okay, but you know it's it's. You're getting the better end of the deal, if you can hear me. <laughs> so here we go. Animal, vegetable, miracle. A year of food life. A fair definition of American food is that it typically travels farther than Americans do. Our average food item covers 1,500 miles to reach us. Because industrial farming um, and because of industrial farming and food transport, we're now putting almost as much gasoline into our diets as into our cars. When my family moved from Arizona to a farming community in southern Appalachia, we were called there for many reasons, including extended family, but one of our reasons was food. As the U.S. population made a mad dash for the Sun Belt, one carload of us jumped ship and headed for the promised land where water falls from the sky and green stuff grows all around to begin the adventure of realigning our lives with our food chain. Naturally, our first stop was to buy junk food and fossil fuel. <laughs> In a cinder block convenience mart on the outskirts of Tucson, on moving day, we foraged the aisles for road food. Our family's natural foods teenager scooped up a pile of energy bars big enough to pass as a retirement plan for a hamster. <laughs> Our family's congenitally frugal mother shelled out two bucks for a fancy green bottle of about a nickel's worth of iced tea. As long as we were going crazy here, we threw in some 99-cent bottles of what comes for free out of drinking fountains in Perrier, France. In our present location, 99 cents was a bargain. Arizona was suffering the worst drought in its history, one inch of rainfall in the last seven months. Even a desert can die of thirst. As we gathered our loot on the counter, the sky suddenly darkened. After 200 consecutive cloudless days, you forget what it looks like when a cloud crosses the sun. We all blinked. The cashier frowned toward the plate glass window. Dang, she said, it's gonna rain. <laughs> I hope so, Stephen said. She turned her scowl from the window to Stephen. This bleach blonde guardian of gas pumps and snack food was not amused. But better not is all I can say. But we need it, I pointed out. I am not one to argue with cashiers, but this was my very last minute as a Tucsona. I hated to jinx it with bad precipitation karma. <laughs> I know that's what 
what they're saying, but I don't care, she avowed. Tomorrow's my first day off in two weeks, and I want to wash my car. <laughs> miles we drove that day through desperately parched Sonoran badlands, chewing our salty cashews with a peculiar guilt. We had all shared this wish, in some way or another, that it wouldn't rain on our day off. Thunderheads dissolved ahead of us. In our desert, we would not see rain again. Now we are settled on a farm in southwestern Virginia, in a county where cashiers almost always speak up for rain during a drought. A disastrously dry summer would mean neighbors losing their farms. It would affect school enrollments and local businesses. It's not a trivial difference praying for or against rainfall during a drought. Historically speaking, humans tend to get what we wish for. What are the just desserts for a species too selfish or preoccupied to hope for rain when the land outside is dying? Should we be buried in our own clean cars to make room for wiser creatures? We'd surely do better, if only we knew any better. In two generations, we've transformed ourselves from a rural to a mostly urban nation. Most people of my grandparents' generation had nearly an instinctive knowledge of agricultural basics. What vegetables grow well in one's immediate region? When they are in season? And how to live well on just those, with little else thrown into the mix beyond a bag of flour, a pinch of salt, and a handful of coffee? This knowledge is gone. We also have largely convinced ourselves it wasn't too important. The baby boom psyche embraces a powerful presumption that education is a key to moving away from dirt and manual labor, two undeniable ingredients of farming. It's good enough for us that somebody, somewhere, knows food production well enough to serve the rest of us with all we need to eat. If that is true, why isn't it good enough for someone else to know multiplication tables and the Bill of Rights? Isn't ignorance about our food causing problems as diverse and serious as our overdependence on petroleum and epidemic obesity? The multiple maladies caused by bad eating are taking a dire toll on our health, most tragically for our kids, who are predicted to be this country's first generation to have a shorter, life expectancy than their parents. That alone is a stunning enough fact to give us pause. And so is a government policy that advises us to eat more fruits and vegetables while doling out subsidies not to fruit and vegetable farmers, but to commodity crops destined to become high fructose corn syrup and feedlot grain for cheap burgers. Many of us do understand that our food choices are politically charged, affecting arenas from rural culture to international oil cartels and global warming. Plenty of consumers are trying to get off the petroleum-driven industrial food wagon. This book is about how our family joined that small revolution, trying to integrate food choices with our family values, which include both love your neighbor, and try not to wreck every blooming thing on the planet while you're here. <laughs> Families in many other countries have food pledges hanging over their kitchens, subtle rules about cutting the pasta by hand, making with care instead of buying on the cheap. Though they also may be busy with jobs and modern life, People the world over still take time to follow foodways that bring their families happiness and health. My family happens to live in a country where the main foodway has a yellow line painted down the middle. If we needed new rules, we'd have to make our own, going on faith that it might bring us something worthwhile. This is the story of a year in which we made every attempt to feed ourselves animals, vegetables, and even minerals whose provenance we really knew. Our highest shopping goal was to get our food from so close to home we'd know the person who grew it. 
Often, that turned out to be us, as we learned to produce more of what we needed, starting with dirt, seeds, and enough knowledge to muddle through. Or starting with baby animals, and enough knowledge to refrain from naming them. 